our speaker uh, for this year's ICCM is, is no stranger to many of us in the Crisis Mappers community. Andre is an information management officer from uh, UN OCHA. He's usually based in Geneva, Switzerland, but as Jen just mentioned, he's uh, been deployed to the Philippines a few days ago already, so couldn't be here in person, but this is holding up now, so that's great. Between emergencies, Andre's focus is on supporting OCHA's information management staff uh, from all around the world and leading OCHA's collaboration with the Digital Humanitarian Network, a network that I had the privilege of co-founding with Andre. Andre has also been working in information management for well over a decade now. In 2010, he was deployed both to the Haiti earthquake and to the massive floods in Pakistan. He was instrumental in spearheading the Libya crisis mapping efforts in partnership with the Standby Volunteer Task Force in 2011. And he's instrumental, very core to the Digital Humanitarian Work uh, Network's uh, operations today as well. If there's one word to, I think, describe Andre, that he's a translational leader. He's able to pivot from the established formal humanitarian organizations very easily to then digital humanitarians. He understands both worlds very, very well and can play a very important, and does play, a very important translational leadership role. So we'll, we've asked Andre to speak for about 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll uh, go into questions. Um, so if you have questions, please keep them somewhere ready so we can uh, uh, ask them. And, and remember, there might be a bit of a, of a delay. If you're uh, online as well, uh, follow the uh, hashtag ICCM or live stream. Please post your questions to ICCM or Andre. And I think uh, on, Jen also mentioned, if you're not really doing anything really important online right now, just to keep the bandwidth up and, and Andre with us, then uh, please, please shut those um, platforms down. So now, please help me welcome all the way from the Philippines live video Skype, Andre Verdi. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, it's great to be joining you from Manila. Yeah, so I want to go back and, and, uh, and first I say thanks to, to Patrick and, and Jen for you know, arranging this, what will be their last one, at least uh, for a few years, in terms of taking the lead. And uh, you know, I'm quite excited to, to see the announcement that the ICCMs are, are already planned for the next uh, three years. It's been very exciting and interesting. Groups that are going to be to be handling those, uh, so it looks like a great few years ahead. Uh, and as I mentioned, just sorry before I got cut off, I'm I'm not in the Philippines. You know, it's, it's, the the emergency itself is you know pretty much catastrophic. We we were out in the Philippines. It's uh, it's been pretty crazy hours, and I, you know it, it's quite interesting to to be out there versus responding virtually as I have in many uh, many other emergencies as well. I had a call today with my wife back home, and I. I sometimes wonder if it's more difficult to be out in an emergency, uh, sometimes with you know, some responders screaming at you for information, or if it's more difficult as my wife has been left at home with uh, a job and a half, but two kids to look after, and I, I kind of wonder who's doing more work sometimes. Uh, but back to the story here, I wanted to I wanted to give a bit of a background. Uh, I wanted to tell a story. Uh, I'll try to. I don't know if you can if you'll be able to see this. But I'm going to go through a slide that I have um, uh, that, that tells a bit of the history and, and how we got to where we are today in the Philippines. So what do you see in front of you, and, and I'll get to the bigger story there, but this is Valerie Amos. This is the Undersecretary General from the United Nations. She's the Emergency Re uh, uh, Relief Coordinator, the most senior humanitarian uh, out there. And she was in the office today, and I had the opportunity to hand her a package of of infographics that try to explain the emergency. And in that package, what she had was this slide. And this is a who's doing what, where slide that we put together a few days. And I want to tell you why that one is important. And I'm going to hold out for a couple more minutes. So I want to go back a few years. I want to go back, and we'll start in 2009. And although we all know, if you've read the report that Mary Milner and, and myself put out about collaborative innovation in the uh, age. It's been technology and volunteerism that's really driven innovation from way back from the, from the creation of, of, of the modern humanitarianism and the Red Cross and so on. 
So this is innovation and technology is not necessarily something new to the humanitarian sphere, but the technology and what it has enabled is really changing. And I think in 2009, I, I saw one key event, this is when the Crisis Mappers Network was formed, you know, by people like Patrick and Jen and, and others like-minded people getting together. But the challenge at that time was people were spread all over. It was a big, loose network. It was great, but it was still a big, loose network. We could reach out to them, but you didn't know who was going to respond, if anybody would respond, or if it was just what individuals were even in there. So in 2010, we all know, we, we heard this story probably just a few too many times, and that was the Haiti earthquake in January 2010. And what I found interesting there was that as a result of Haiti, a lot of people started forming into groups. There was a standby volunteer task force that was created later, but it was crisis camps and crisis commons. But this is when, let's say, many of the volunteer technical communities started forming up. Of course, there's some of the great ones like GIS Corps and Map Action that have been around for many years, but this is when we saw a lot more, especially ones that were being enabled by very modern technology. But in 2010, I was in Haiti. I was in the tent. I was in that photo at the top, and this was just when the tents were getting set up, so things looked nice and clean. But it was 40 degrees in that tent. There was cargo planes taking off above our head every three minutes. And you can see that there's several information people sitting there, and, and unfortunately, Nigel's note, if you're watching, I've got a picture of the back of your head here. But we were in a tent. It's 100% crazy. And I knew what I knew on the traditional side. So we went in, we set up our regular processes, but it was pure crazy. And there was no bandwidth for us to receive new ideas. We had to deliver, and we had to deliver the regular things, and we had to deliver it fast. Now, at the same time, was, as many people have probably seen, the photo of Patrick Meyer's living room of the volunteers sitting around computers in a very different environment, trying to help the Haitians that have been affected. But what... I sort of drew here this line between the two. We were very disconnected. I remember being sent the, the Ushahidi map, and I opened it up. I looked at it. I saw a bunch of red dots. I sent myself an email saying, there's something here. I don't have time, but there's data behind it. It's a gold mine, and we need to figure it out. We had individuals of all kinds of different organizations just sending us random emails saying, we got the greatest thing uh, since somebody figured out how to slice white bread and we want you to use it. And at the same time, we had 1,600 or more people come through the operations center asking for information, all within a, in about 10 to 12 days. So it wasn't something we had the bandwidth for. Now, going to the next slide, in 2011, after Haiti, I spent a lot of time discussing with people like Patrick Meyer, uh, like Kate Chapman from OSM, really trying to understand what is it that these groups are trying to do? How, how do we interact with them? And when Libya happened, it, it, it presented an interesting case where we didn't have access to the country. People were leaving. At that time, I knew we had to do something. And yet, OSHA and, and regular partners wanted us to do everything that we usually do, but without access, we needed to do something different. And so I volunteered to take on a regular test, noting I wanted to do it a different way. And that was you know, because there was no other way, I was permitted. And that's when we put out a call. I still remember the teleconference with uh, the standby, standby task force, open street map, map action, and so on. And we had, we had different ideas, and one of them was, was to create the Libya crisis map. And we went ahead with that. And, of course, a lot of people at the time asked me in, in interviews what was the impact. And, and there was, it was hard to measure at the time what was the impact. The long-term impact, and I'll talk about this in a minute, it is directly to things that, that you guys know about, but it's also changed many of the things that have happened internally inside of organizations like OCHA, how we collaborate with our field-based staff and so on. So going to the, the second slide of 2011, I'm showing a map here. And this, for those who have been out in the, in the management emergency, have seen this kind of map. This is the traditional who is doing what where map. All right, looks like an OCHA product. Most people wouldn't have a clue that it was any different. This was traditional data, but it was augmented by social media data collected and verified by volunteers. 
this was a big first in the UN world in the sense that we were using data from volunteers or crisis mappers around the world. Now going to the next slide, later in 2011, you know, I realized in, in discussions with OSHA, this, this, was, this was the beginning of a change and we called for a lessons learned meeting in New York City. And this brought together uh, the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, brought in ICANN, Peace and Peace, and we, then we brought in Open Street Map, Map Action, and the Task Force, the OSHA Columbia team that, that had helped us significantly. Uh, and and uh, and some others, and really we discussed what is it that, that we learned and what is it we need to do. And this spun up several different ideas. Uh, and, you know, we discussed well, how do we know what the decision makers are? How do we measure impact? Uh, how do we coordinate data collection during emergencies? And, and, and then one of them was, do we need a specific standby task force for humanitarian issues? Now, going into 2012, so the next slide, what we realized was, no, we don't need another group of volunteers. We don't need a dedicated group. There's already a lot of groups out there doing amazing things. And this is where the Digital Humanitarian Network was born. And the concept was, groups like OSHA have troubles working with, or understanding how to work with, uh, this first group of untouchable group of volunteers or thousands of volunteers around the world. I literally had somebody from a formal organization approached me once and asked, how do I call the volunteers? Do I just call Patrick Meyer? And so this is when I realized, no, we need, to, we need to put in some kind of interface, at least to make the initial connection a little bit easier. We need a light footprint. So well, let's get it set up and let's be a net so that we this, this interface. It makes it much more easy for the traditional organizations to understand. Now going to the next slide, what we started realizing was, okay, well, that was great to have in place, but organizations still need a little bit of guidance. Now, I, I saw a comment on Twitter earlier today about the, the value sometimes of writing guidance and, and these kind of documents versus doing it. These, these things are still extremely important. So in 2012, uh, I, I worked with Louise Capello and Natalie Chang, both who were there. Uh, Louise talked last year at ICCM about the Asian Network, and it's nice talk. Natalie understands that she talked today. And in 2013, they worked with uh, uh, Annie Walden, Chloe Bamberger and uh, Quentin Nikesi and, and developed a couple of cl uh, collaboration guidance. And I have to say, the one on the left that you see, the guidance for collaborating with volunteer and technical communities, has printed this out and have shared it with so many formal organizations. And it just gives them a sense of peace. That, you know, this isn't just some crazy, untouchable group of thousands of volunteers. And these things, although they seem bureaucratic in many ways, can be extremely helpful in letting people understand the concept and interfacing between the two sides. Now moving to the next slide of the first one of 2013. As I mentioned earlier after Olivia, we had the, the wash-up meeting, there was other groups that were born, and one of those was around the, you know, trying to figure out what is it that the decision makers really need in the early people like Erica from George Washington University, Jared from MIT, Bartel from Israel slash Tilburg, Lars Peters from ACAP, we, we brought a bunch of uh, responders together and, and did a workshop and really identified and tried to categorize them as much as you can with a two-day workshop, what is it that they need? But it also used, you know, working with a few other individuals, we put together a taxonomy of what decision makers are actually out there and how big that is. Uh, and so you know, we've published this material for those who have seen uh, my blog, this, this kind of material is all published there. But these are the kind of things that, that, that the communities are bringing a variety of actors, from academics to crisis mappers to the formal humanitarian side, are starting to put out these materials to start the constructive discussion. I'm going ahead again in one more slide in 2013. And I mentioned earlier, the papers that I worked with Mary Milner on, the Collaborative Innovation in Humanitarian Affairs, really goes deep into the history in terms of technology and volunteerism and humanitarian age and really looks at what is it that we would need to move forward at this point. Yes, Disaster Relief 2.0 mentioned many things and, and several papers have been written, but I really wanted to get it. What kind of governance structure, what kind of interface do we really need? You know, and she really dug into the digital humanitarian networking and, and spent a lot of time researching it. And it's a great report trying to figure out what is it that we have. And one of the big things is that the digital humanitarian network it's something, and Patrick mentioned, I believe this is in, in his opening, that it can really play a, a role if 
you know, we can keep up the momentum. Uh, maybe as a selfish plug that, that, that perhaps some donors make funding available to, to help these kind of new setups mature and, and, and function well. Now, moving a little bit later into 2015 and getting up to the Philippines time, I think, you know, you all know what happened. Uh, but I want to tell you there's been a few different things that maybe not everyone is aware of. The Digital Humanitarian Network was requested on a few different occasions. A couple of times, and at least one time, it actually stood down because we found that, uh, that work was being by another done by another organization, so there's no need to duplicate. So there was two activations it took on. Actually, three, sorry. One that most people forget is that the group actually helped the regional office of OSHA in the Pacific look for material related to the, 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 the typhoon when it went through Palau. It's often one that we forget. The first one around the Philippines brought together GIS Corps, Humanity Road, Standby Task Force, the Micro Mappers Tool, Translators of Order, and it was technically supported on the back end for the mapping component from, by Esri. Now, these are groups that knew each other because of the Digital Humanitarian Network. In cases, they had collaborated before together. They knew each other because they met in many of them in 2012 at a DH Network Summit. And they actually came together, and, and in my opinion, the map you see in front of you is one of the easiest crisis mappers, crisis maps I've been able to use and actually show to non-techies. And by that, I mean people who hardly can use a computer, but they could really easily understand rather than drilling into big red dots or clicking on a thousand little images somewhere to see what might be there. This is one that people really understood. And they understood that, oh, I can look in these different areas of the country, and we're not assessing in a certain area or doing assessment, but we can look at these other areas to get a quick picture through maybe what's going on. Now, there was a second digital humanitarian network activation. The second one for OSHA was one I requested. And this is the one I'll talk about again in a second, but... This is one where they went out and they have been collecting a lot of response, operational response information for me to augment existing products. And I'll come back to that. So there's I mean, like other couple of things that the Digital Humanitarian Network has enabled, and that's a lot of connections. And one of them is that there's a phone signal strength project that people were wanting to kick off. Some people contacted the volunteers. Others, like the FEMA Innovation Team, uh, was trying to get involved. The telecoms were involved. The SNA was involved. But what I did was, because I happen to be on many of these mailing lists or having met these different people at, at different events, actually bring them together and put them together to have that discussion to make sure they're all working together and hopefully provide the solution that, that's optimal. There's also an SMS discussion going on, and, and Patrick and, and Anna here are both there, you know, know very well. The MSF was, was questioning about creating this. OCH is involved. Uh, Internews has been in the discussion, the SMA, open government in the Philippines, uh, you know, the assessment team is going to, is willing to be involved, the communicating with the communities uh, group is willing to be involved. So really bringing these groups together. And, and, and this is where I see that, you know, we're moving into this sort of network age where technology is really starting to enable us to build these networks during times of crisis. It doesn't replace the meeting and, and discussions and collaborations between emergencies, but it really helps during the emergency. So moving just quickly to the next slide, uh, you know, I captured a nice one here of Patrick showing the Digital Humanitarian Network uh, uh, earlier today. And for those who didn't think I was there, I was still getting pictures. Um, but, you know, this is bringing these groups together, and I understand from the coordinators the group is going to expand, there's going to be, you know, additional membership, the membership site, so it's a really exciting time looking forward to the Digital Humanitarian Network. Now, I'll move to the next slide, and I want, I'll go, it, goes, it actually goes back to the OSHA, who's doing what, where, the summary of response activities graph, and what's important here, and I want, I wanted to share this, is Probably somewhere between a half, a little over half of the data that's in this is from our traditional partners, what we call the humanitarian clusters. But what else is there is data from a website called bangonph.com. There's data from Map Action, who is collecting it from different individuals around the country. But probably somewhere around, I would guess, a quarter to a third at least, is public data collected by the digital humanitarian network. Now, this data, essentially, we took, we 
augmented the existing data that we had, and we produced a better picture of what's going on. So I get questions today, like our reporting officer was asking me, well, how many organizations are responding in the country? From this data, I can, I can guess that. And I would suspect that the Digital Humanitarian Network actually found, I think we ended up with 95 total, but I think the Digital Humanitarian Network probably found uh, somewhere between 40 and 50 percent of those, because they were finding different ones that aren't necessarily always tied into the coordination mechanism. Now, going to the next slide, it, it takes us back to the one with Valerie Amos. And what's interesting here is the packets of infographics that she's received. The very bottom, the left-hand side one, that you can hardly see, in this case, she looked at just before, was the product that the Digital Humanitarian Network helped us produce. The one that's on top is actually an independent volunteer, Filipino, who was creating infographics I was put in touch by with because of connections through Open Government Philippines and the bangonph.com website. And I found out the infographics he was doing, and these were great graphics, and we shared them with Valerie Emma. Now, these got into her hands because they came through sources that I trusted, ones that I had met outside of emergency. It wasn't just because random people sent me emails or anything like this. So going to the next slide, this is where I say, and for those who have read my blog, will know that I'm a big advocate for this. It's meeting people outside of the emergency, having those discussions. And I gave several cases of that already. And then adding the crisis, this is when you're going to have innovation happen. I am getting multiple Skype messages, multiple emails from different people who have connected to me at some point or another, who I may know a little bit, suggesting all kinds of ideas for me in this emergency. Unfortunately, I don't have the bandwidth to take on all the amazing new ideas and new platforms people want. But the ones that we've spent time before the emergency, this is when we've been able to do things. So going to the next slide and moving outside of the years along the side, what I want is I want a group of people that want to build the future. Now, what I mean by that, by going to the next slide, is I want people who are willing to build networks. And for those who are Don Tapscott fans, I'm talking about Global Solution Networks. This is the Digital Humanitarian Network. And I've had a conversation with Don and Anthony Williams, and they, they are telling me that, you know, what we're doing when I talked about the Digital Humanitarian Network is they're saying that's, that's a very good case of a Global Solution Network and, and the way the world needs to work in the future. And so I really hope that we can build the Digital Humanitarian Network and other networks to do that. But I also believe that going forward in the future, context is going to be important, and that's where I'm hoping groups like the Crisis Mappers will really be able to help drive us forward, trying these new technologies, doing these new things. Now, I'm playing with a lot of these apps. Uh, you know, I, I, I use Google Now that, gives, that tells me spring times of the day when I should go to work or go home, but does some really, really cool things. But I, I really think that we got some really interesting possibilities going to the future. But let's, let's build that together. So I'm going to wrap up the presentation at this point. Uh, on the last slide, I've, I've got my, my, uh, my Twitter handle and, and my, and my blog post there. But I, I just wanted to say that, you know, we're really in an age where I think technology is changing. It's really changing the way that we're working. I see the way that it's changing things inside of OSHA. Even in the Philippines, we've got the Digital Humanitarian Network is supporting us. But we've also got multiple OSHA staff around the world who are doing things for us. We have staff in Pakistan helping us. We have multiple staff in Dakar helping us. We had staff in Geneva helping us. We've had ones in DRC help us. We've had people from different places around the world help us virtually. And that's been enabled directly as a result of the collaboration we had after Libya when I started setting up Skype groups and Google Docs to use uh, within our information management. So I don't want to take much more time, but I really wanted to you know, say thank you to the Digital Humanitarian Network, to the Crisis Mappers, for those who have been helping us out in the Philippines, but also in a very selfish way that have helped me learn, have helped me understand ways to change and hopefully drive change uh, within the community to go forward. So I hope that by everyone being together today and, and tomorrow and so on, that you guys have those great discussions, come up with the good ideas, and really try to find ways to take them forward. And I'm always open for, for collaboration. Uh, 
I'd invite you to get a hold of me now, but I will be honest, and at this point in the emergency, I probably won't respond right away. Okay, well, let's, let's hope he hears this. Can we have a really big, big round of applause for Andrew?